why am I beginning a video on medieval Welsh history with a Jewish cemetery? There is a very good reason why I'm showing you this. Because in the last video, I ended it with this. Doubt. The product of a new civilization in Wales. What is this new civilization in Wales? I thought about it as I was reading this book. When was Wales by Gwyneth Williams? How to explain to you. And it requires a short video for you now explaining what this culture produced. What was Wales? The flourishing of it that caused England to get so angry and invade and wipe out our country or at least try to. Why did they do that? What were the English of that age destroying in the first place? This is Benjamin, your host. That's what this video is about today. When the Normans truly pushed further into Wales in the 1090s especially, we were not passive. We fused with this Norman French culture, evolved and pushed back. And nowhere was that more clear than in our literature and our ecclesiastical cultural produce. Because when they came in, they wanted to abolish our ancient ecclesiastical institutions because it was so old and so deep in the ground, it proved Without any doubt, we were a nation not only far older than them, but far older than the Saxons, which they had just extinguished. Our ancient cultural institutions scared them. And it's here that we see a fight put up toughly around Tewewi, especially with the bishops there. We write down the lives of our saints to combat claims of hierarchy against Canterbury. Caragaint is the word for Canterbury in Welsh. And in Llenddewi Nant Hrondi, we get a huge collection of ecclesiastical writings, mostly in Latin, but a bit in Welsh. But that's not the point. The point is, it was focused on our culture, how we were expressing ourselves and making claims along our ancient traditions, right to exist. And this flourishing came because the Normans brought new technologies of writing. How we wrote our own language, some of the letters began to change. How skins were produced to write on, uh, scriptoriums, rooms within religious institutions where monks gathered to copy manuscripts. It became an industry for the first time, truly. In the west around Tavewi and up north, well, mid Wales, Herdigion, Llenbadan Vaur, you had a family based there on Cillian, who was actually from Cornwall. This is still an extension of the old world at that point, in the middle of the 11th century. A town in Cornwall was named after this man, Tresillian. He was interacting with Vikings, trying to evade them and they went back and forth between Tevewi and Kimber and Bauer. He and his sons were very active in combating this new monastic invasion from the Normans, writing down all religious tales and Bichev, a life of a saint, Bichevai, the lives of the saints. And his son Hrigvach was coming of age at the center point of this and he produced the life of Dewi Sant, the life of St. David, really emphasizing the national element, stating clearly his claim to rival the overseeing Karagaint Canterbury. They were making the claim that we had the right to a separate legal jurisdiction in ecclesiastics. This was fervent patriotism and Gerach Gamro which I mentioned of his writings 
in the last episode. That's part of this flourishing and he was fighting for this church to exist through his works as well, not just his travels of Wales. Around this Llan at Llanbadarn, we get people writing the Brit Abrinhinoedd. This is a chronicle uh, covering our history. We're passing on the collections of what we had earlier, accumulating them, adding on Norman influences, especially Geoffrey of Monmouth, which I'll get to in a minute, and shaping them according to our Welsh requirements for a political state, what we hoped to become, and how we saw ourselves in each of these ages reflects in what they wrote in the Britabrinhinoedd, the Chronicle of the Kings. And it was finished at Estrad Flir, a beautiful center of learning which was destroyed as much was destroyed later during the conquest. In this period, we get the flourishing of Bredetowisogion also compiled in the same southwestern region. This Chronicle of the Princes is our most valuable text for source of Welsh history in its own age. It covers an annals and entries year by year from the year 621 and the death of Cadwallader, who briefly conquered North England, all the way through to 1332. That's astounding, the breadth of time. If you were writing the history of your people from the seventh century, with entries in each year all the way into the 14th century, who can deny that you were a nation? And this was directly our response to this coming in of this Norman French military juggernaut and cultural prestige such as the world had never seen thrown against us. This world the Normans brought in was full of learning, lavish architecture, education, and this was the age in the 12th century going forward really that universities begin to bloom across Europe. And Welshmen began to go to present day Italy and Paris, and then Oxford, where we established a permanent presence to this day. I'll put the link to the David Gwilym Society in Oxford, an important part of our Welsh history. These men began going to these universities, Welshmen forming groups with each other interested in the culture of their own country, bringing back what they learned from Europe and this Norman aristocratic culture. And they replanted this new knowledge in our soil. And we began writing in Welsh about all kinds of subjects, not just the arts. We have tracks in Welsh on medicine, plants, the beginnings of science and astronomy in our language, not Latin, even at times, but in Welsh. That's remarkable. So few, so few languages so early can claim this learning in their own language. And yet it's blooming in us because we've been hit so hard by this Norman French move in by these martyr lords, which I explained in a bit more detail in my last video, but see this kind of a line here, along this blurry line of frontier. We absorbed Latin and French and really said with Welsh, but we're responding to this by producing learning. And nowhere is this so vivid in our response that our core poets, a Goginverd, the poets of the Welsh princes and kings. They change. For the first time, we see images of people looking through windows and glass in our poetry. It becomes more material. Speaking of new types of metal and wood, carvings, ornate gowns, jewelry, wines. It's remarkable. It's an explosion of new words, especially for architecture and fashion. New items. It's much more material and culture, we begin to absorb the ideas of finance. Our great poit, Candelo Maur, 
is a poet to three different kingdoms. The Penkev, the, the poet of the king, essentially. These poets sing, they don't just say. And Doangwen's son, who will a Boangwen of, is a type of a new poet incorporating kind of this troubadourian French chivalric love into his poetry. And this is only a getaway that he can get away with because he's a prince, just like Owen Kivelyog. Owen Kivelyog is more of the heroic warrior tradition, echoing the poetry of a Nerin in the Old North, the drinking horn in the hall. But our poetry, it's not something that prizes your individuality. Don't think of it as they thought that innovation was being yourself. No. Oh, there was a strict meter, a strict way of doing things, a long series of rules about the language itself that was used, the metaphors. And then if, if you mastered all of this, then you could add some of your personal flair. David Benthras, literally David Cod, the fish, he came a bit later, but he was very patriotic, asking the, the ruler of and the Great to expand the borders far to the east, calling on the Welsh to push back, expand the kingdom, daring to call his benefactor a king. This was the age in which an unknown scribe or scribe, some geniuses, put together in writing the four branches of the Mabinogi, and the other tales and romances of the Mabinogion express a vivid, deep French influence of chivalry and knighthood. Especially as we come to Arthur. It erupts through this fusion with French. Arthur moves out of his rough and tumble, brutal, heroic Celtic mythology into a round table with French accents. And his Bretons, Flemish and French are brought in. It is a Breton from Gwent. Geoffrey Monmouth, Geoffrey of Monmouth. Who really fuses these two together in their finest, highest form. Historia Regnum Britanniae, the history of the kings of Britain. This tells the story of King Arthur and Merlin to some extent. And all through the history, these kings from Rome all the way through in a romantic view with this subtle French light shimmering over it, the whole story. And then he goes on to write the life of Merlin, the prophecies of Merlin, and these collections of work explode. They sweep across the French dominated continent. They ignite a blooming that sweeps all the way through Germany. The Crusader kingdoms in Antioch are celebrating King Arthur as a hero. He's mentioned in Egypt in the Byzantium Empire. This is, for medieval terms at least, a global phenomenon that erupts a tidal wave of cultural power out of Wales. And if you want to know why the English later felt so afraid of us, that they had to conquer us. It's that we were doing through peace what we could not do through war. We were conquering all of Europe merely by altering our native tales just a bit to adopt the new French style and then exporting it to the world to give us cultural power. On the Chrétien de Troyes, a new Arthurian romantic cycle, the matter of Britain, revolutionizes literature itself in France. And France itself, and Brittany especially, go on to churn over these tales of Merlin and Arthur, over and over through the centuries, but it's our seed that injected that into it, that began that turning. So why did I mention Judaism at the beginning of this video? There were Jews in the martyr lordships to the family Claire. They came in to the southeast to places like Aveni, Karachion, 
task went. For over a century before King Edward comes along and conquers our country, this Judaism is part of our country and it's, it's about to give us something truly unique as happened in Spain, Portugal, later in Poland, France, all of Europe, everywhere there's a Jewish culture, you get a culture which is not completely dominated by ecclesiastical norms and it allows a flourishing of learning that's outside the prohibitions of the church and we were about to be given that birth of Jewish culture it was on the cusp but King Edward conquered our country 1283 1284 and 1290 he expelled Jews from England the kingdom of England and this included it came to include Wales rather and we must remember that when our country was conquered, that new civilization that had been born was sliced down. But that included the Jewish culture as well in Wales. But what was conquered? The state rather than the culture that it produced? I had to make that video about what that new civilization was. Next time, we get into the political state that was emerging upon the eve of Welsh conquest. Diolch and Thank you very much for watching.